So what I'm going to talk to you today, up to about today, is, as you can tell, exploring the subglacial environment. So the subglacial environment is one of the least explored on Earth, but of course is vital for our understanding of glacier dynamics. So we want to understand what's going on underneath the glacier. We can do it in a number of ways. We can look at sedimentology, which is great, but of course that's once the glacier has left, but we do get quite good spatial coverage. We can use geophysics to find out what's going on underneath the glacier. And again, that's good for spatial coverage, but doesn't tell you very much about time. But if we want to know sort of how things change over time, then in situ process studies are a really great way of seeing the sort of dynamism that's under the glacier. Slight drawback is, of course, it's quite a lot of effort to, draw, to drill each hole. So usually you get a sort of small area that you're covered, but you are covering it in you know, a lot of detail. Now, as uh, Davy said in her introduction, I, I started my career by looking at, at tills trying to study subglacial deformation, uh, looking at North Norfolk. Um, the cliffs look like this from a distance, they're all sort of deformed tills. When you go up close, you see all sorts of incredible structures. Um, and as, as Tavi said, I've, I've got a couple of my early papers there. I worked with Geoffrey Bolton, but I also had the pleasure of working with Richard Hindmarsh. And of course, it's very sad that he um, died very recently, but it shows the sort of exciting things that, that Richard did. He, he modelled all sorts of all sorts of tills. So what I want to talk to you about today is innovative techniques of measuring the subglacial environment, some results from our in situ experiments, and then sort of briefly relate this to sedimentology and soft bed um, subglacial hydrology. So just a sort of quick reminder, um, glaciers move by, by creep, sliding stick slip motion at the glacier bed but also by subglacial deformation that I'm going to be talking about a lot today. Uh, the sun shines on the glacier surface, melts the surface and water goes down to the bed and um, glacier shoots forward and also um, increases subglacial deformation. So I want to talk today about four sites, four sub um, soft bed sites um, that I've been working on over the last 20 years, really. So the first one is Brickdalsbury in Norway, really lovely glacier. We chose it because it was um, very extensive, easy to get to, very accessible. Unfortunately, this is what it looked like in 2001. Unfortunately, it melted pretty quickly. And by 2006, it had retreated a lot continue to retreat. Um, so, so we had to move and we moved to Skalafelsjökull in Iceland. Um, another lovely glacier here, we're, we're working up um, on the top here. And then more recently we've moved to work at Fjallsjökull and Bredemerkjökull. So what we did was one of what we wanted to do was uh, study the glacier using what's called an environmental sensor network. So what this is, is you have a, a series of sensor nodes in the environment, send their data to some sort of base station, which then forwards the data onto the internet. So the idea is you have this sort of seamless flow of data from the field onto the, onto the internet. And then once you've got that data, you integrate that with data from other sources, and then you can make an interpretation, a visualization. And I suppose the aim is to have this sort of seamless flow from, from the field right to an interpretive um, interpretation. We, we use this um, sensor network, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute at the beginning of our, our project. But then over time, we developed more to this idea of Internet of Things, which you might have heard of, IoT. And the difference here is that the sensor, whilst, if I go back one, in a internet, sorry, in an environmental sensor network, sort of one way from the, the, the nodes to the internet, um, internet of things is more a, a um, two-way process. And the idea is that you can, can talk, in theory, um, from, your, uh, from the internet 
back down to the sensor nodes. And so change, in theory, change what they sense and things like that. So it's more dynamic. And also you talk to it through these internet protocols. So each sensor node is essentially like a website. And so in that way, it's much more easy, in theory, to use. So this is, I'm going to talk to you about the, the GlaxWeb project. So this is sort of like the first environmental sensor network project in a glacial environment. So what we did was we used a hot water drill to drill down to the bed of the glacier and insert our nodes into the sediment, into the till and the ice. So the nodes, uh, if you can see this, this is a, a probe. Um, so it has all the sensors encased in, um, in the one probe. Data is um, sent up by radio to the glacier surface where it's then forwarded to somewhere that has mains electricity and then it goes on to a server and then onto the web. So we were able to have this data come back um, onto the internet um, whilst, whilst the system was working. So all the instruments are within this probe and this is about 16 centimetres long. So here are the probes, they're encased in a, a polyester case. When we started, we used um, 433 megahertz, but we were able to go down in frequency as the um, technology improved and miniaturization. And so as we went down in frequency, we got better um, penetration. And what we measured was um, temperature, pressure, strain, resistance, tilt, and, and voltage. And we essentially installed 20 between 2003 and 2012. And each sort of iteration of the system got, got slightly, slightly better. So as I say, they send their data back to a base station which sits on the glacier surface. And it also has a weather station and um, a GPS system. And it was powered by um, wind and solar. And the, the, one of the problems with the system, of course, is that everything has to be severely waterproofed because water is everywhere, um, which of course is lethal for any sort of electronics. So it was all encased in a very waterproof box. And then you need this reference station somewhere with mains electricity. And this is a, a photo from, from Iceland. And there happened to be um, a cafe nearby, which we were able to mount our, our equipment on. And then in the final year, we were able to get a Wi-Fi um, sent from the glacier here to this local farm, um, which is about 15 kilometers. And that quite, worked quite well. Um, but pr prior to that, we were using the um, mobile phone signal, which is pretty good uh, in Scandinavia, much better than it is here in the New Forest. And so we were able to, to collect all sorts of data, and some sort of sketches here, my photos here, and GPR, and, and here's the the hot water drill drills down to the bed. And we also developed our own custom um, geophones, which they're connected by wires, but they've also sent their data back um, via the internet. So this is just a um, video showing the, the probes on their journey down um, into the glacier bed. So what, what we do is we um, use a hot water drill to blast out the till and then um, insert the probes and then the till closes around um, the probes and they become incorporated into the till. We also um, developed some time-lapse cameras and were able to use um, image processing to then calculate the discharge. And we were very impressed with this because this technique, although at first we thought it wouldn't work, it did actually work remarkably well. And the data we had is very uh, similar to a local um, gauging station. And since then, um, numerous people are now using this technique um, for discharge. And more recently, we've then gone on to develop these web-connected RTK GPS systems. So traditional GPS systems, obviously, are very good, but they're very expensive. So you can never have um, very many of them. So this is a system that's much cheaper and, again, sends its data back um, onto, the, onto the web so you can read the data live. Uh, this particular system uses this Pixie multi-system and we got the, the data back from um, Iridium satellites. 
again, there's all the problems of, of waterproofing. Um, and so the same sort of extreme waterproofing system is used. So I want to go on and talk about what we found. And I first want to talk about what we found about till behavior. So this is our first results from Bricktalsbreen in Norway. And so this shows a year. So it's from day um, 2.13. So it's basically from summer through to the, through to the next summer. My oh, cursor's gone a bit strange. Um, yeah. um, no, wait, 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 sorry, cursor problem. Right, so the... Um, so this is showing uh, water pressure over one year. So um, water pressure, <laughs> I'm struggling with my, with my cursor. Um, so we have um, in, the, in the autumn, sometimes the water pressure is relatively high, but then in the winter, it's very low, uh, rises in the spring, and then is very high in the summer. So I've completely lost control of my cursor. <laughs> it might. Yeah. You switch the um, laser pointer off. Maybe that will help. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, pointer options. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. It went really peculiar. So um, this is a, a, um, a graphic of how the, the probe was behaving once it was put into the till. And you can see that at first it moves around quite a lot and that's because um, as i said again initially you've blasted this hole and it takes a while for the till to kind of surround it but once it does and it's become incorporated into the till you can see it, it remains in this sort of upright position then i'll show you what this looks like um, on, a, um, on a graph so in the winter the tilt changes by about 0.6 degrees a week so obviously the glass is not moving very quickly and the glass is moving slowly in the winter and the tilt's moving very slowly so the tilt is very is very small but then as you start to to go through the season and move into spring it moves to about two degrees per week then in, in the summer it's about three degrees a week at the early summer and by late summer it's moving about four and a half degrees per week, but it also starts to move in the other direction. So it starts to move in um, sort of transverse direction as well. If we look at the um, diagram here, and this is again the same uh, going from summer to summer, and this is showing um, the case strain. So that's the strain against the probe um, sides. There's an interesting thing in the summer that it does um, change direction. So how do we interpret this? Well, obviously in the summer, there's this really high water pressure and we think this reflects ductile deformation. So the till is moving, well, the sediment's moving under the glacier. And we think that this is the, the type of, um, of deformation that's going to produce these amazing structures that we see within quaternary tills. But then if, if we move back to the, to the winter conditions, where we have very low pore water pressures but we see in the till in the sorry in the um the case strain there's quite a lot of movement going on and if you look at this this actually relates to to warm days within the um the air, warm air temperature days so we interpret this as a very low water pressure in the winter but maybe brittle deformation going on within the till so you can see their movement is directly being transferred transmitted by the grain structure and this is going to cause fracture of grains and very many tills have a series of brittle fractures and faults within them so then if we move on to look at scanner in iceland so again this is from summer to summer so one year's worth of data in the summer again we have this really high um, till port pressure this time we've got some some um some data about discharge and it's very very high as expected but it's kind of intermediate velocity 
But in the winter, now this is sort of unexpected, we keep having these sort of events going on and these events occur every time it's, there's a warm day. So when we have a, a lovely warm day, sort of about two degrees um, throughout the Icelandic winter, what happens is the water, the, sorry, the water pressure suddenly drops. Um, there's a huge increase in discharge and um, a dramatic rise in velocity. So we interpret this as it's, it's a warm day, surface of the glacier has melted, the water goes to the bed of the glacier, the glacier shoots forwards. So we can then sort of think about sort of stick slip motion going on in, in at the glacier bed. So Frank, I'll, I'll just explain this, this diagram to you. So this is showing a typical day in the summer. So temperatures, there's in the, the blue here, sorry, the red is, is air temperature. So temperatures warm up in the morning and then they cross some sort of threshold. And then what happens is the glacier shoots forward. So this is a period of sliding that we have. Then the glacier reconnects with the bed. Um, temperatures slowly uh, decrease over the course of the evening. And during this time, this is when we, we see from our tilt data that we have deformation. You sort of have this period um, in the early morning where there's very little movement goes on. And then things speed up again um, in the following morning, here and here, where we have deformation again. So every day we sort of have this cycle of sliding and then a different amounts of deformation. But then if we look at the winter, and of course some people think there's not that much happens in the winter, we have a very similar pattern, except instead of it happening every day, it's happening over a series of days and it's triggered by these warm events. So um, every time there's this warm event when temperatures rise above zero, the, the air temperature rises, the velocity rises and again we have sliding going on. Then again the glacier reconnects with the bed um, during the second phase and we have deformation. In the winter we then move into this third stage where actually there's very little um, deformation goes on at all and then um, temperatures, um, although they remain cold, we seem to have reconnection with the bed and uh, deformation increases. So again, we have these four stages in the winter, but both summer and winter, they're both related to bursts of meltwater coming into the system. So then we can kind of calculate how much time each of these stages happens throughout the season. So we can calculate it for the melt season, for the winter and the whole year. And then we can sort of ask, well, what does that do associated with the sedimentology? So presumably when we're having sliding going on, we may be having lodgement being produced. Whilst then the other stages, we will have ductile deformation going on. And then um, in the winter, we may have um, either no deformation or brittle, brittle deformation. So we can calculate that over a given year, probably we've got about 10% of the time sliding and about 70% of the time is deformation. And that sort of continues to show us really that deformation can continues the whole year. So if I, if I go back to these four sites that I've been talking about, so at Brickdale's Breen, we had good tilt data, but not particularly good velocity data. But from the tilt data, we were able to look at this pattern of stick slip motion, and in fact found virtually the same, except the slightly different timings, which I'll say a bit more about in a, minute, in a minute, but it still had those four stages. Now our best data comes from Scalafalgiacu because we were lucky enough to have the probe data, uh, really good velocity data, and this um, discharge data from the, um, from the, from the, the webcams. At the Algiacal and Brain and we only really have this um, a GPS data. However, because the data at the Algiacal is so good, we're able to essentially relate the tilt data to the velocity data. And so then we could reconstruct um, an estimated tilt data for the Algiacal and Brain and um, 
and then from that we could then calculate their relative stick slip motion and again they showed a very similar pattern with slight variations which i'm going to show you now so from the four glaciers we can then calculate the percent time for sliding and deformation and it seems that uh, Scalafasciacle and Fialciacle have a relatively low amount of sliding, while the other two have a much higher amount of sliding. But I'll come back to that later. And just, I guess, finally about, about Till, just to sort of show you this little time lapse that we've got of um, Fialciacle. And it shows the, the push marine being developed. And this is, this is November. And again, it shows you that deformation is really happening throughout the whole year. And in this particular case, um, the sort of movement of the till in that moraine is um, about a third of, um, of the summer version. But it really, this sort of data really shows you that, it, and there's a lot going on in the winter. The winter is not a time of um, you know, quiescence. It's just a little bit slower, that's all. Right, so now I want to, to go on and talk about soft bed hydrology. So we know that in Greenland, people that have produced quite an interesting patterns of, of um, hydrology underneath the glacier, and there's been a lot of studies and it's relatively well known. The majority of Greenland, of course, has a hard bedrock. There are soft bedrocks and more soft bedrocks are being found um, every year. But this is in contrast, of course, to the West Antarctic ice streams, where, which are underlain by soft bedrock and, of course, are thought to be very unstable. But recent years have sort of shown that there's a very, um, there's a different type of subglacial hydrology associated with soft beds, in particular these swamp-like braided river systems. So if I come back to our, our Scalafelgiacal data, if we look at our data over the whole year, we can look at the different seasons and we can look at the amount of discharge, just, sorry, discharge and surface melt, so inputs and outputs. And in spring and autumn, the inputs and outputs are relatively similar. But in summer, we have this kind of weird situation where there's a, obviously a huge amount of surface melt, but we can only account for about half of it coming out in front of the glacier. Now, obviously some of it may go into the ground, groundwater, others of it um, may go into the till, but it is a really big difference. And then in winter, we get the opposite situation where there's a small amount of surface melt, but a huge amount of discharge. We also found from our GPR that there's about 6% um, of the surface of the, um, the base is covered with water bodies and about 84% with the forming bed. But these water bodies are arranged like a braided river system. They're very irregular. So we've come up with this model, which we think explains what's happening um, at Scalafell Circle. So we think that underneath there is this braided river system and that through the summer, as there's more, more, more water goes into the system, so the anastomosing increases. But the water is stored essentially within the subglacial uh, hydrology itself. So water is starting to be stored in these sort of backwaters and, and uh, sort of ponds. Then during the autumn, as the um, amount of water into the system starts to decrease, so the water starts to then go back into main channels and water gets left in a series of, of sort of ponds and sort of disc this um, continuous areas. So then when we have a winter, um, obviously for most of the days, there's very little water traveling through the system. But then we have these warm events, these times when the temperatures rise above zero and the water goes to the bed of the glacier. And what happens is that the glacier actually lifts up. And when it does, this water is then released out of storage. So a huge amount of water is released far more than is actually put into the system from the melting. And then after we have this huge flood, the glacier um, drops back onto, the, um, back onto the base, and then there's a new drainage system is then re-established. 
and then uh, during the spring, the spring um, as water levels increase, so the system starts to, to wake up. So if this is, is true and there's a, a braided river system beneath um, a soft bedded glacier, how common is this? We've, we've shown it for Scalafell Circle, but how common is it with other soft bedded glaciers? So this is why we um, moved on to look at Brady Mercury Urkel and Fjallshi Urkel. So these are the places where we've got um, a series of uh, from GPS stations. Now straight away if we look at the GPS system, so the, um, the sort of orange is Fjallshi Urkel and the green is Brady Mercury Urkel, we can see that Fjallshi Urkel has these dramatic um, winter events. So here's the winter, I guess, sorry, this is again from summer to summer. And this is air temperature. So again, every time there's a, a warm event in the winter, we have um, the glacier shoots forward. But in contrast, a brain mercury, it's not really doing that. There maybe there's a tiny movement, but it's not on the same level at all. So brain mercury, although they're adjacent, it's not responding to these warm events. So we tried to see how, um, because we've only got a few GPS stations, was to look at the other um, arms of Brain Mercury. So our, our station is here. So we used the Sentinel-1 data and used remote sensing to work out the velocities. And then we used, um, then we compared how, um, what the variation, essentially how large these peaks were. And we found that for Fjallsjökull and these two western arms, they both have, all three of them, similarly have these winter events quite, um, quite um, distinctive. Whilst these two don't, don't have them at all, and the eastern arm sort of the least um, distinctive um, winter event. So from this we could see that there were two types of um, subglacial hydrology, even though they're adjacent to one another. So we've obviously got the, this type one, which is all, almost the same as Scalafell And so we think this is the example with the Braided River Channel, which has the high storage. So water is released in the winter because there's storage for it to be released. And then we thought, well, maybe that the reason why these are not behaving like that is because they don't have the storage. The storage is being um, discharged into the huge Yokosanan lake in front of um, the glacier. And then we realized there's sort of a way we could test this was because um, Goodmanson and Bjornsson showed that this medial moraine which separating the two um, arms of Brain Mercury Uncle, have actually been moving east over time. So in 2008 it was here, but by 2017 it moved across um, to the east. But we luckily had some um, other remote sensing data from 2008. So we were able to look and see um, if the winter events occurred during um, 2008. What we in fact found was that, I put this line on here, and this is the, the one we're looking at. If we think, of, so this is sort of variation, of how, how big those winter events are. Um, here, Fialgia, called it. They're very large, both in, in 2017 and 2008. But here in this, this centre one here, back in 2008, there was um, distinctive winter events before it was captured. Essentially, its drainage was captured by um, Yokosana. So we would suggest that the reason that Brain Mercury Urkel is behaving like this is because it has low storage and that's draining out the water so it can't respond to these winter events. Now if we go back and, and look at Brickdalesbury, um, even by looking at it, you can see that it's got this large um, tunnel at the front and we also did the GPR over it and we concluded that it had kind of a normal channelized system. So, um, this is showing that actually not all braided river systems, sorry, not all soft bedded glaciers do have um, a braided river system. But instead, there's kind of a continuum between the channelized systems 
and the breather systems in these soft belly glasses. And that Fialgia Arco and Brigham, and sorry, and Scalafalgia Arco has the braided system. Brigdos Breen has this channelized system. But Bring Mercury Arco kind of has an intermediate system between the two. So these channelized soft bed systems, uh, Brick does bring have, have a high percentage of sliding. So when I say percentage, it means time, which we also found at Brain Mercury, of course, that they um, a lot of sliding, whilst at the other two, there's far, there's far less time that they have sliding and more time deformation. Uh, the channelized system has this low response to winter events, whilst uh, we have a high response to winter events at the, uh, the braided systems. And that's because presumably a brick does bring, there's no winter stories, though we're not sure. Um, low winter storage at Brady Mercury and very high winter storage. So I've talked to, oh, I've sort of rushed through this, but so if I've I want to talk about now about how we can um, apply these results to quaternary tills. So to sort of go back to when my work that I talked about at the very beginning. So I think our work really does show that deformation occurs all year. It's just there's more of it in the summer, but it, it does occur in the winter as well. There's lots of implications for fabric because we've actually got real data of how probes are moving in the till. And that we're able to show this four stage pattern of stick slip motion, which is daily in the summer um, and dependent on the melt in the winter, but both driven by bursts of melt water into the system. And it was found in all those four glaciers. And you can see there we have approximately uh, 20 to 10 to 30 percent sliding, 50 to 70 percent ductile deformation. So, till sedimentation is going to be accumulation of all these processes. Um, so that it's very difficult, obviously, when you look at till to try and pick out an individual process, but it's good to remember that it's a combination of those processes. And that associated with this high soft bed hydrology, we can, if it's channelized, we expect to find eskers or, or canals. But if it's abraded, then we expect to find these intra-till sand lenses, which are essentially the bars within the braided river system. And then, of course, because we've got this constant deformation, these inch till sand lens are then going to be deformed themselves. Then, what are the implications for soft bedded hydrology? Well, Iceland is a really good analogue for the West Antarctic ice streams because obviously it's, it's a lot easier to work on, although it's still, still difficult. I think we've been able to, to show that this continuum between the channelized and the braided behavior. And that the, I think the exciting thing is that in this braided river system, the water is stored within the subglacial environment and then it's released during these pretty exciting winter events. And I suppose the next question is that how common are these winter events and what is their implication for glacier retreat? How, and so to sort of look at these problems, um, I've been lucky enough to get a new um, Leverheim grant which is starting in July and, and these are the people that are going to work on it and we're basically we're going to work um, on these these issues. Right so some final comments. Um, working in the subglacial environment is pretty pretty difficult um, and you need a dedicated and multidisciplinary team because nobody knows all the different um, elements that you need. Um, you need to know details about computer science, engineering, as well as glaciology. Um, you need funding, it's, it's really expensive. I mean, even though the probes themselves are probably perhaps about £300 to make each, but that doesn't include the cost of the postdocs and all the sort of R&D to actually to get it to work because it, they are you know, then every, every part of it is custom made. And you need a lot of patience and good humour because, as you all know, working in a glacial environment, uh, it always rains and it's always cold and everything always goes wrong. Uh, so it's all about, uh, you know, having the, the patience to carry on and uh, to get over problems that, that always, always occur. I think that 
one of the problems of working with electronics in a glacial environment, of course, is that there's water, there's water everywhere and water and electronics don't go together. It's much easier when you've just got a little shower. So the future. Well, this Internet of Things is, is really good because it makes your sensors more web-like. So you have this chance to actually talk to the sensors and change, change what's going on and respond to, to events. And this is it's much easier to have a system in theory that's Internet of Things than the older system. However, probably the big problem is usability. At the moment, as I said before, you do need to know a great deal about it to, to, um, to make it work. It would be lovely if they would just work like a mobile phone um, and so it would be easy to work, but hopefully that's in the future. And I think perhaps another element that we really need is this seamless integration that I talked about at the beginning. It would be really nice to go easily from the data in the field to integrating with other uh, data sources, which at the moment is not possible. And again, needs a lot of fiddly um, bringing together of the data, but that would be a lovely thing to do in the future. Now, I couldn't possibly have done all this on my own. I'd like to thank all the, the many people who've helped on the expeditions to do this and have kept cheerful um, through all sorts of upsets and bad weather but uh, oh, that's all part of glaciology so um thank you thank you very much jane um that was wonderful um what we usually do with questions is uh get people to indicate in the chat if they have a question and then just get them to unmute themselves and, and ask the question um while people are thinking, maybe I'll take the privilege of having a first question, if that's OK. Yes. I was really interested in the diurnal signals that you showed um, in the summer. And I remember in the classic textbooks, I show the, my students these, that do you remember there were various um, early on measurements that showed how the diurnal response of alpine glaciers varies over a season with um, sort of small melt signals in the spring um, providing essentially a small um, or initially small um, dynamic responses and then perhaps much bigger dynamic responses than later on in the season so that the surface melt actually has a different um, impact on the dynamics of the glacier depending on um, the time of year. You described a kind of average di diurnal signal for the summer and I wondered whether there was enough data to actually say something about how that varies across that melt season and how maybe the breakdown between sliding and deformation changes therefore across that season so that we learn something very profound then about the response of the glacier to input of water across the season in terms of its dynamics. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really good question because I haven't actually looked at it like that um i suppose i it, i looked at it yeah in a turn sort of the average it is an averaged out pattern and i haven't looked at it i mean i've looked at things like how velocities changed over the summer and the discharges changed over the summer but i haven't I haven't looked at what you suggested, which would be quite interesting, and I will go away and do that. Yeah, fantastic, because it's yeah. the first. It was the first question that yeah. struck me because of those early experiments yeah. that looked at the changes in the hydrology yeah, and the right. changes in the surface dynamics. But here yeah. is the changes in the basal dynamics too. Mm. Yeah. No, I'm going. I'll go and look at that. Thank you. Um, are there any other, any questions from anyone? Um, in the audience. Hester, would you like to unmute yourself and ask? Yeah, hi, Jane. And it's hi. really nice that you actually like combine the, the present observations with like with the till observations and try to make some hypothesis of, of how some things work. So I had um, one question about the fact that the, the fact that you had two different hydrologies in several of these glaciers in Iceland, but at the same time, some of these glaciers where you said it was uh, kind of a dendritic system, 
or a channelized system, they also had proglacial legs. So my question was a little bit about how much does that buoyancy, like even, even though the glaciers are grounded clearly, but there's still some buoyancy at the front. So it, how, how do you kind of differentiate between the different behaviors between glaciers that do have the proglacial lake and not? And what you now attribute to having different subglacial drainage systems? Yeah, okay. If I just go, oops, wrong way. Uh, if I just go back to the, yeah, to this one. So um, even, even the Scalafell has got a, a lake in, in the front of it. Um, I don't need to tell any, uh, Magnus or, or anyone that poor old um, Icelandic glaciers are being <laughs> you know, suffering from these lakes in front of them, developing at an incredibly fast rate. Um, I think that the difference is that it depends on how deep they are. So, say for instance, this lake here, it currently is not that deep. Assuming this one's pretty, pretty shallow, but this is, I haven't got the figures to hand, but it's very, very deep. But if you look at the, um, the profile, um, the GPS, is retreating quickly and soon it will be in a much deeper part of the lake because it's got this reverse slope and so then it might be affected and could behave the same as break mercury local so in my answer to you i'd say that at the moment those glasses are not the buoyancy is not really affecting them because it, the water's not deep enough at the moment but there's potential for it to get much deeper as it retreats um, yeah, my question was really about like the difference between the winter and the summer behavior. It seemed yeah. to be less in the glaciers that had proglacial legs. So, sorry, could you could you say that the, again? The, the the typical winter behavior that you you found in the glaciers was only in those that did not have proglacial legs in front of it. Uh, no, uh, Fiancio of course got this. Okay. It's like, but it, as I say, it's pretty shallow, so it's not, I don't think it's having a big effect. Okay, moment. thank you. Roger um, has some practical questions for you, Jane. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your talk, Jane. Much, much enjoyed. J just wondering um, how deep it's practical to deploy your, uh, your package of toys here, whether you have plans to go to anywhere uh, where it's all a little bit thicker. Yeah, um, the the radio really won't go go further than the seventy meters. Um, we lose it after seventy meters because obviously, you know, there's all the water in the ice. I mean, our plan was always to try and use a relay system mm -hmm. so that you would go deeper um, and put probes that would then act just as relays to go back up through. Because the reason we're using I should should have said that the reason we're not we're using the probes. And not the wired system is obviously the wired system can break and things like that and obviously with tilt it's yeah, not sure. it's not rotating in three dimensions so our plan was always to try and have a relay system unfortunately we ran out of money before we were able to do that but i think that was with this system that would be the only way you could do that sure um, yeah it's understood i mean did did you do any kind of site survey first? I mean, did did you do a surface GPR to decide whereabouts to drop this through? Oh yeah. Because yeah, obviously, you know, you look at your own results; they're they're incredibly localized. With all yeah, we had to find where the rivers. So forth. Yeah. Yeah, we we used the GPR to map out where the subglacial rivers were, so that we avoided them. Okay, cool. Um, though sometimes we accidentally did drill into a. Uh, for Pleasure River, <laughs> which is annoying after you've gone to all the effort to drill the hole. Um, sure. Yeah. And and I mean, did it did it occasion the the idea or the opportunity to to do repeated surface GPR because you're obviously finding things that are changing through the the seasons, you know, changing through time with you know differing soft bed activities. It would be really interesting to see how they're expressed in surface GPR, which is what we rely on so often. Yeah. Um, no, we didn't do that. I mean, it would yeah. have been nice to have done that, but we didn't. <laughs> I, I realise you you need an even bigger team of willing victims or yeah, that's volunteers, right. whatever you want to call them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we. Did, I was thinking at Brickdale's Bream, we did an interesting thing where we um, 
we essentially tethered the GPR down and turned it on um, every half an hour, I think, for a couple of days. And we could see how the water changed with that. Um, but that, that was at Brickdale Spring where the rivers are relatively, well, we think the relative, rivers were relatively stable. But I think you could do that in somewhere like Scarfell, you know, put it down and keep turning it on and off. Well, presumably now you can probably automatically turn it on and off, so it'd be less um, arduous. Sure. Smashing. And the, the last practical thing, if I, can, if I can grab just one more, did I hear you say it, you had a geophone at the bottom as well? Yeah, uh, not the bottom, and um, in the, uh, yeah, hanging into the, into the, the ice. Okay, yeah. yeah. Because it's, it's always interesting as a seismologist to, to be able to record at the surface and in the subsurface simultaneously to do all kinds of up, up versus down arrival separation and so on. But uh, yeah. I'm sure that's a different story for, a, for another seminar. Yeah, but we, we did have our, and we, we did, I can't remember how deep it was hanging, but yeah, we got some really nice results from that. And you could see those daily um, when the glacier reconnected with the bed and then... Um, the sliding etc and that that was really good from the geophone mm, smashing Th thanks very much once again cheers are there any other questions uh hester it was my mouse too um so i had a question about fabric because what what i was really curious about is that you you're your probe is kind of elongated like class in, in the typical tail fabric cover. And then you have the typical rotations, you know, the tail, the Jeffrey rotation and Taylor rotation, I think it's called. But what I understand from you, if the class behave like your probe does, then you actually have a seasonal difference in your fabric. So the interpretation of your tills later on are kind of, are they then an average of this seasonal behavior? And can we then, in the bigger scale, maybe differentiate between till fabric in in stadials and interstadials, kind of in the bigger scale, in terms of having more subglacial water or less? So my question is really like, is is fabric actually more dynamic uh, in terms of that than we think it is? <laughs> well, I, I I think that the, I suppose. One of the problems with, with doing this is you don't, the till is um, uh, yeah, it's an aggregate of all the different processes. But I think all you can do with these modern day processes is sort of em em emphasize how there's so much going on. So yeah, so we have one year and the, the, the probe is moving a lot and you can see that the rate at which it's moving and it's also sort of turning in that, that other, other direction. And, and it's, it's definitely kind of moving like that. It's so frustrating that it then stopped. So we don't know if it continued to <laughs> continue to rotate or or move you know with the with the um with the tail but the great thing about it is that we've got now some sort of rates that it moves and yes obviously it's, it is moving faster in the summer than the winter but i don't think it's a bit like musical chairs when the you know when the when it stops <laughs> you, you kind of don't know what it was doing before but yeah and i think the main point is that that they, they move throughout the season they move more in the summer than the winter but they do move in the winter okay. so and then i had a quick question about did you ever use uh, seismic stations too because ultimately the the question is how well is the glacier coupled and how well is the behavior of the glacier coupled to the behavior of the subglacial uh, sediment so um Iceland obviously has a lot of seismic stations and oh, I think only those that are maybe on glaciers, maybe from other groups, you may actually have an independent kind of data set that you can you can check some of your hypothesis with in terms of whether the glacier jumped forward in terms of the, the flow velocity really. Oh, that's a really good idea. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. We, we did borrow one of the um, seismic kits from the seismic people in Leicester and got some data from that, which kind of, in a sense, calibrated our geophones, but I didn't, and which picks up the glacier movement, but I didn't think about using, yeah, the, the official seismic stations. Do you think that they would be 
detailed enough? Because obviously they're small glacier movements. When, when they're off, I, I only know of some studies in Svalbard, when they're off ice, like seismic stations, they, they can get some calving events, but I'm not sure whether they can get like the stick slip, you know, a little ice quake motion. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a really interesting idea. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. I didn't think they'd be precise enough, but I haven't. You're right. There were, has been some work in, in Svalbard. I remember hearing a talk about that. So, yeah. OK, well, thank you. I will look into that. That's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Jane? Um, I have a, a, a bit of a question about one of the answers that you gave rather than about the talk where you talked about um, mapping subglacial rivers. Mm. Um, and I wondered what aspects of the radar signal you were using to, to do that? I'm using the, um, they saw reflection power to, then obviously in the field, we're just looking at it, um, you know, eyeballing it to see what's lighter and picking that and assuming that that's subglacial river and darker, but it isn't. But obviously when we got home, we did the, the proper analysis. And it, you know, you know it, it matches pretty closely. Thank you. Are there any last questions for Jane? Let me just check uh, on Facebook. Uh, there weren't last time I looked, but let me just know that don't seem to be um, any from Facebook. Well, thank you very much indeed for the talk, Jane. Um, and thank you to everyone for coming. Um, so I need to tell everyone about next week's seminar. I don't have a title slide, so you'll have to just uh, to, to listen to it and uh, see it in the chat. Next week's seminar will be by Sue Cook from uh, UTAS in Tasmania, and she'll be talking about ocean-driven melt of Antarctic ice shelves. So thank you very much again to, to Jane for the talk, um, and uh, hope to see everyone next week. And anyone who's at AGU now, well done for attending both, and uh, see you next week. All right, thank you. Bye.